Welcome! Today we will discuss symmetries and Noether's theorem in quantum field theory. Now symmetries play just a very 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 important role in physics in general and of course in quantum field theory. And we will see that using Noether's theorem we are going to be able to find information about our theories that would have been very very difficult or maybe impossible to access otherwise. So of course, we need to explain a little bit about what Noether's theorem is. I will go a little bit quicker about it because it's very likely that you have discussed it in previous courses, perhaps in some sort of uh, Hamiltonian or Lagrangian mechanics course that you may have had in the past, um, but we will still cover it in case you haven't. So to begin, let us, of course, answer the question, well, what is a symmetry? So the definition that I like the most is this one. It says a symmetry of the theory is defined to be a field transformation by which the Lagrangian density changes at most by a total derivative such that the action remains invariant and thus the equations of motion are also invariant. Okay, so the whole point is that if we do some change, then we don't want the equations of, the equations of motions to change, okay? That is what we mean by asymmetry. For example, if you have something that is spherically symmetric, um, if you do uh, <laughs> this rotation, right, you just rotate it, then nothing should have changed and you should have still have the same equation of motion. So we have used some aspect of symmetry before, but of course it's going to get a little bit more abstract and complex, uh, but you know, the basic principle is of course the same. Now, what does Noether's theorem say? So Noether's theorem tells us that every continuous symmetry gives rise to a Noether current, J mu, such that d mu of J mu is going to be zero, right? So that current is going to be conserved. And this, of course, should be valid upon use of equations of motion, which is what we call on shell. Okay, so we will go into that later. And it's important that you um, take that concept into account. So on shell and off shell, we are going to start using it every now and then because it's going to pop up more and more as we go into more advanced uh, topics here in quantum field theory and beyond. So very important, so continuous symmetries, so of course something like um, time reversal or something like that is not really going to be, be coming into play here. And this is very interesting because what this is saying basically is that if we have a continuous symmetry here, then it's going to give us a conserved quantity, right? That's what they're saying. Its derivative will be zero. It's going to be a conserved quantity. And we're actually going to go into that um, in, in just a few minutes. But first, of course, we can't just state a theorem. I have to prove it. So let's begin working on the proof uh, to Noether's theorem. So first, let's begin just by defining what we are going to be uh, referring to when we see a transformation. So if we have our field phi, then our field is going to transform to phi plus some epsilon and some variation of phi. Now, of course, we could consider higher order um, terms here, but we're just going to stick to first order in epsilon. That's going to be enough. And keep in mind here that this variation, we can call just x, right? Just some x and this x is going to be a factor just like we have seen in previous cases when we are talking about fields. It may depend on the field itself and it may depend on its derivative, so d mu phi. Now, what about the Lagrangian? Well, the Lagrangian, well, this would transform. We, we say that what we allowed, right? We said it in the definition, right? This symmetry, it can affect the Lagrangian by up to this total derivative, right? Uh, up to the total derivative as we saw right here, right? That is what we have stated. So we can allow this to be Lagrangian plus, now let's just add some small epsilon and now our variation of the Lagrangian. Okay, and of course you could have again some higher order, but we are not really going to uh, care about that. Here, of course, the variation in the Lagrangian is going to be uh, some derivative of, you know, some magnitude f mu that we have not specified yet. So now let us take a little bit of a look at what would happen if we were to vary the Lagrangian. Okay, so if we take this variation of the Lagrangian, which of course we know is d mu of some unknown f mu, right? So let's take the variation here of the Lagrangian. So of course, 
the Lagrangian depends on phi and the mu phi. So what we can do is take here uh, the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to phi and just multiply by the variation of phi. Now this may look very familiar to you because we have done something uh, very, very similar to this in the past. And maybe you have seen this before when we were first deriving here the Hamiltonian and the Lagrangian formulations of the Klein-Gordon field theory, for example. And then just like before, we have now the second part. So the derivative with respect to d mu phi and of course times the variation of d mu phi. Okay, so uh, none of this should be anything too new for you. If it is, don't worry. I'm just going to I'm just going a little bit faster than we did the first time we encountered it. Uh, but you should still be able to follow along. Okay, so now what we are going to do is actually exactly the same thing uh, that we did the, the past time that we encountered this. So what that is is we are basically seeing that we have this d mu phi here. So we say, well, in principle this here could be the result of a of a product rule right if we had the total derivative of d mu right d mu of d of the lagrangian density d d mu phi and then the variation of phi keep in mind that you can exchange the order you can exchange the order of the variation and the derivative if you're unsure why i do recommend that you go back a few videos i will put the link in the description uh, because i've already proven that in that other video so taking this derivative we would have the derivative d mu dl d d mu phi of the variation plus the uh, here of the Lagrangian, d mu phi, this hasn't changed. And now we have the derivative of the variation, but we know we can exchange them. So that means it's the variation of the derivative of phi. And this term is exactly what we had up there. So that means that we can write this part inside the blue box as, let's do it like this. So that is equal to this part minus this part okay so, and that's exactly what we are going to do so we're going to write this as d mu f mu which is equal to now the first part hasn't changed i'm taking that part over there so d lambda d phi variation in phi and then plus this part so plus d mu partial of the lagrangian density d mu phi variation phi and then we have minus this other part so d mu now be very uh, careful this derivative only affects this part okay not the entire thing so derivative of the lagrangian d d mu phi variation of phi okay so that is what we have now so what we can do now is combine our terms or basically factor out the derivative term in in these two uh, per, uh, the, these two parts that have the derivative outside. So we can write this as d mu, and here we can have this, well, it depends on which side we want everything to be on. We can maybe write everything to the right-hand side. It's going to be better in the long term, even though in principle, it doesn't really matter. So this would be d l, d, d mu phi, variation of phi, minus f of mu, and this should be equal to now these two terms, but with a minus sign because they are now on the other side. So this would be d mu, d lambda, not lambda, sorry, l, d mu phi, variation of phi, minus now the derivative with respect to phi and variation of phi. Now let us do a little, just a tiny bit of algebra on the right hand side so that you can see what it is because although it looks very nasty, well, we have actually encountered it before. So we can factor out a minus sign. So the first part would be now minus and the second one would be plus. So maybe I'm just going to move this over to have a little bit more room. So minus d mu and this is now plus. And we can also factor out these variations in phi. So just factor them out. And what do we have here? the derivative of the Lagrangian density in this case with respect to phi minus d mu, the derivative with respect to d mu phi. This here right there 
is Euler Lagrange, right? And we know that the symmetry that we, or the transformation that we are currently applying is a symmetry, which means, of course, that we haven't changed the, the equations of motion. And what are the equations of motion? The equation of motion, of course, is that uh, this derivative minus d mu dl d d mu phi, right? This thing is equal to zero. This is the equation of motion. Okay, so that's very important. So this means because we are on shell, all right, so because we are on shell, this thing right here is all going to be zero. Okay, so this thing is simply zero. And here we go, we have just proven Noether's theorem. Why? Because we now have here in blue, so let me just write it here in red for a drama, d mu, and this thing here is j mu, is equal to zero. And what is j mu? Well, we are seeing that j mu would be, um, this would simply be d l d d mu phi times the variation that we're doing to our field minus f mu. So that is the current that is associated to a particular uh, transformation. So the two things that, or rather the three things that we need to know to apply this are the Lagrangian density. We need to know what the variation to the field is, and we need to know this F. What was the F? F was basically the variation on the Lagrangian, right? So it, it appeared for the first time here, this variation in the Lagrangian density, which we said is going to be the derivative of this F quantity um, that we have to know when we're doing a transformation. And don't worry, because we will do an example very soon. Okay, so that first part of Noether's theorem gives us now the following lemma. We get that every continuous symmetry whose associated Noether's current goes to zero as x goes to infinity, right? Sufficiently fast, we want it to go to zero sufficiently fast as x goes to infinity, right? Then that continuous symmetry gives rise to a conserved charge Q such that its time derivative is zero. So this is actually a very, very important part of, of Noether's theorem that we'll actually use quite often in the future. Okay, so just a, a quick recap before we go into proving this. If we have a continuous symmetry, right, it has a, an associated Noether current, then we know that we have some conserved charge and we can even find it. Okay, so first let's prove it, then we will use it. So the proof is quite straightforward. What we're going to do is define our Q, but our charge to be the derivative over the entirety of space of, well, of course, d3x, and this will be of our zeroth element of the current. All right, so the current that we defined before, this is going to be the zeroth element, right? We had j mu, where mu was 0, 1, 2, 3. So this is going to be the zeroth element. And we have to integrate over all of space. So now let's find q dot, right? The time derivative. So q dot would be the time derivative of what we had before. So we have the integral over all of space, d3x, and now the derivative with respect to time of j0. Okay, so, so far, nothing too crazy. Now, however, keep in mind that our current satisfies d mu, uh, let's stick to the same j, j mu is equal to zero. What does this mean, right? We can now write out this d mu j mu explicitly. So that would mean that we have the time derivative j zero plus now, well, all the other derivatives di of j i and since they're equal to zero this means that the time derivative j zero would be equal to minus the spatial derivatives times j i so we can use this to plug in here so we can use this plug it in there i used slightly different notation so i guess we can just uh, write them in the same way so this is time derivative so that means that we get let's stick to red so the integral over all of space, r cubed of d3x with a minus sign and now the spatial derivatives of j i. Okay, but 
this thing right here is supposed to go to zero as our x goes to infinity. So this whole integral is simply going to be zero and thus q dot is simply zero. Okay, so um, that is the proof of the lemma that I just gave you. Okay, so now let's just look at an example. So this is the example of the energy momentum tensor. And I just wrote down our formula here so that we can remember it. So what we're going to do is do just a space-time translation. Okay, so we're just going to move through space-time and just see what we get as the conserved current and the conserved charge from that. Now, you may already know, right? If you have some, some system that is symmetric under time translation, then the energy is conserved. If you have a system that is symmetric under space translations, then the momentum is going to be conserved. So you may already know that from other courses. Now we're going to get to that same result, of course, but uh, just to using Noether's uh, theorem, and it's also going to give us some very useful expressions that we're actually going to be using in the future. So under a global space-time transformation that goes like this, right? So we can say the transformation is going to be that our x mu will transform into x mu minus a mu, right? We're simply doing a, transform a translation in space-time. Then if we have this, our field is going to transform into the field plus a mu d mu phi, right? That's the way that the, uh, the field transforms. So here, keep in mind that this is going to be um, the variation of the field. And now we can go find the Lagrangian. So the Lagrangian here is going to transform into the Lagrangian plus a mu, and now the derivative d mu times the Lagrangian, right? It's going to change up to this a total derivative, but now we can do a little bit of an algebraic trick here. So we can write this as a nu times delta mu nu. But we can, of course, change the order of the delta and the derivative. So we get d mu of delta mu nu times the Lagrangian. Okay, so with this, we are now in a position to find the Noether current once we have chosen which Lagrangian density we want to, to study. So of course, in the quantum field theory course, we are currently looking at the Klein-Gordon uh, theory. So of course, let's use that one. So the Lagrangian density for the Klein-Gordon field theory is one half d mu phi, d mu phi minus m squared phi squared over two. So with all of this, now, well, of course, keep in mind that this right here would be what we had defined previously as the f mu, right? We said d mu of f mu. Okay, so that is uh, what we have. So with all of this, let's now plug it into our uh, Noether current. But keep in mind that because this is a particular case, we're going to give it a special name. So this is going to be the energy momentum tensor, which we call t mu. And with the current notation that we have, it's going to be t mu nu, with the nu down here. And you will see why in just a moment. So from this first derivative, um, what we have, right, we only have d mu phi here. We have it once with the index lowered and once with the index raised. But you can just lower the index with the metric, apply the derivative, and then raise the index again. So you end up with a factor of 2, which cancels out the 1 half. So in the end, what you get is simply d mu phi, okay? So then we have to multiply by the variation of the field, which is this thing right here. But we have to be careful because what we have is we have mu's here, but we also have a mu here. And this here is a dummy index. It's a dummy, dummy index because it contracts here inside. So we can just relabel it to nu, for example, which is also consistent with what we have down here because here a nu is also uh, nu, right? So that's consistent. And we just uh, use that. So we have d nu phi. Okay. And you can now see why the index is down here, by the way. So it's because nu's are going to be down here, there, uh, everywhere. Okay. Um, so with this, we now have the first part complete. And now comes minus f. So f is uh, the delta mu nu of the Lagrangian. But what is the Lagrangian? It's going to be 1 half. The, and now be careful again because these mu's they end up contracting, so it's just a dummy, a dummy index that we have. 
we have to be careful and use a different name. So let's either use something like row, for example, just something that we haven't used before, or just don't write any at all because it contracts. So d row phi d row phi, and then minus m squared phi squared over two. So that is what that looks like. And using it, we can find some very interesting quantities. So we know that we are interested in the time parts, right? So in the in, in the zero element of the of the Noether current. Why? Because well, that's what we said gives rise to the charge, right? It is J zero. So here we have a few different things. So we have, in this case, T zero zero, right? Which is of course zero here. It just puts us in the position that we want for the charge. But then we have four different charges. We have T T zero zero, T zero one, T zero two, T zero three. So T zero zero would correspond to the the zeroth component of our space time vectors, which is of course the time component. So what exactly, right? Because we can be doing these translations in any of the four space time directions, right? Time and three space ones. So we need the second index to tell us, well, where in space are we doing this translation to? So if we are doing the translation in the zeroth component, which would be time, that means that the symmetry here would relate to the Hamiltonian, right? To the energy, it relates to energy conservation. So this part here should relate to the Hamiltonian. Okay, and in particular, of course, it should relate to the Hamiltonian density, right? We are dealing with densities here, so to the Hamiltonian density. And similarly, if we go to the other three components, those would be the three space components, and those should relate to the conservation of momentum. Okay, so now we can go ahead and try to find those quantities. Now, again, we have to keep in mind that we are dealing with density so far. So if we actually want to find something like the Hamiltonian, for example, we need to integrate over all of space so that we can actually find it. Okay, so we have to integrate T zero zero over all of space. Um, okay, so, well, what is this going to be? Well, notice, of course, first that what we have here, we're going to be raising some indices and just keeping mu and nu to be zero. Okay, so that means that here we are only going to have uh, the zeroth component, which is going to be a time component. So we only have the time derivative here. So the time derivative squared. So that would be phi dot squared. Okay, then we have minus, and of course, this is inside of the integral. So d3x and over all of space. And then we have minus now the Dirac delta of zero, zero. Well, that's simply one. So no worries there. So minus, and then we have one half of, and now keep in mind this row, well, this is simply a, a multiplication, right? You have, this is an implicit, an implicit sum there of the, that multiplication. So what we have would be phi dot squared minus, and then we have here the space derivative squared, all right? And then we have, well, this closes, and plus m squared phi squared divided by two. And well, all of this is inside of the integral, of course. Let me try to do it like that. So all of this is inside of the integral. So what this means is that we have the integral over all of space. And this would be, so phi dot squared minus one half phi dot squared, that's simply phi dot squared over two. And then we have plus the space derivative squared over two, and then plus m squared phi squared over two. And this thing, right, keeping in mind that phi dot is simply what we had previously called pi, the conjugate momentum, this is simply the Hamiltonian density for the Klein Gordon field that we had discussed in a previous video. So this is simply the Hamiltonian density, which is, of course, what we expected. I mean, I did tell you that <laughs> that would be the case. So I'm um, just showing you that it does indeed make sense. So now let's go um, for the momentum and find an expression that we hadn't found before. So in the case of momentum, we can find pi, right, integrating over all of space, so d3x. And 
this would be t0i. So this would be integral over all of space, blah, blah, blah. And now t0i. So t0i, we need to raise the new index. So we would have t mu, uh, sorry, d mu phi, d nu phi. I will turn them into the respective zero and i in a moment. I'm just first raising the index. So we have delta, uh, this would be mu nu, and we have, well, everything here inside is not really affected too much. So phi, uh, del, wait, I just, okay, no, no, I thought I made a mistake before, thank God. <laughs> okay, uh, minus m squared phi squared over two. Okay, so now let's use that mu is zero, so mu is zero, and nu is i. So this is i. So here we have 0i, uh, 0i. Zero okay, and notice, of course, that <laughs> delta of 0i is going to be 0 because, well, 0 and i can never be the same, right? i is never 0, it's only 1, 2, 3, and 0 is only 0. So that means that all of this part is simply 0. So that only leaves us with this first part right here which we can write in the following way. So first of all, we can lower the index here. We can lower the index. Actually, no need to use that. So we lower the index, but it costs us a minus sign, right? That is only the, the three space components, so they differ by a minus sign. And the zeroth element is the time derivative. So that means that this thing here is phi dot. So this thing is phi dot, which we also know is simply the conjugate momentum, pi. Okay, so this is uh, the way in which we can then find the, the momentum and study it in our field theory that we will use later. So as you can see, the Noether theorem can really be very useful, right? So we can see, of course, that just like we expected, the, the conserved charge associated with space translation is indeed the momentum that is carried now not by particles, but rather by the field itself. And as you can see from this, the Noether theorem can allow us relatively simply to study some very interesting properties of what we are studying. And we are now going to use this result in the next video to continue our study of the Klein-Gordon field theory and the Noether theorem we'll continue to use for a very, very long time. So I hope that this video was useful to you. If it was, please consider leaving a like on the video, commenting and subscribing, and maybe even consider checking out my Patreon. So I'll see you in another video. Thank you very much for watching.